Hello, we're going to be working through a collection of problems I recently gave as an exam covering all topics in this course through rational functions. Problem 1. A line L passes through the points 2, 5 and 0, negative 1. First, what is the slope of the line L? Using the two given points, we're just going to compute m to be the difference in y coordinates over the difference in x coordinates, and this resolves down to 3. Second, what is the y-intercept of the line L? Now, we were given that the point 0, negative 1 is on the line. In other words, if x equals 0, then y must equal negative 1. So the y-intercept is that point, 0, negative 1. What about the x-intercept of L? Now we have the slope and we have the y-intercept, so we can give slope-intercept form of the line y equals 3x minus 1. Then we can set y equal to 0 to solve that 0 equals 3x minus 1, and therefore x must equal 1 third. So the x-intercept is the point 1 third, comma 0. Finally, give the equation of L in slope-intercept form, we already did this as part of our answer to part C, y equals 3x minus 1. So that's problem 1. Next up, problem two. The profit P of X of manufacturing and selling X hammers is given by P of X equals negative two X squared plus 240 X plus 9,000. What number of hammers will maximize the profit? Now we have here a downward opening parabola. It is a quadratic function with negative leading coefficient and any downward opening parabola will achieve its maximum value at the vertex. So we find the x coordinate of the vertex as negative b over 2a, or negative 240 over 2 times negative 2. This simplifies down to 60. So 60 hammers will maximize the profit. Next, what is the maximum profit? All we have to do is take this value of x, 60, and plug it into our profit function. And this simplifies down to 16,200, presumably in dollars, although it wasn't explicitly stated, but whatever, 16,200 is the maximum profit. Moving on. Next up, the graphs of f and g are given here. What is the value of f of g of 3? So the first thing we have to do is compute g of 3. Looking at the graph for g of x, we see that if we plug in 3, that corresponds to a height of 1. g of 3 is equal to 1. Then we're going to take g of 3, which we just computed to be 1, and plug it into f. So f of g of 3 is f of 1. Looking at the graph for f, if I plug in a 1, we get out a 2, since 1, 2 is on this graph here. So overall, f of g of 3 is the same thing as f of 1, which is 2. Next, what's the value of f of f of 0? Now, looking at the graph of f, f of 0 is 1. So we're going to take that f of 0 equals 1 and plug it into f. And as we just saw in the previous problem, f of 1 is 2. So overall, f of f of 0 is also 2. And finally, what's the value of g of f of g of minus 1? Well, the first step is to compute g of minus 1. g of minus 1 is 3. Then we're going to take that value and plug it into f. So what's f of 3? It's 2. Then we're going to take that value and plug it into g. What's g of 2? It's also 2. So all of these evaluate to 2. Next up, what's the domain of the function f of x equals 2 minus x to the 1 half power over 2 minus x to the 1 third? Now we can't have the denominator equal to 0. So if we set the denominator equal to 0, we'll find a value of x that is not in the domain. Move the x over to want the other side and raise both sides to the third power. And we'll see that the domain cannot contain the value x equals 8. But that's not the only restriction in this function. The numerator is actually a square root. And since we're only considering real values, the thing under the square root sign, 2 minus x, must be bigger than or equal to 0. Solving this for x yields x less than or equal to 2. So we have two restrictions. Because of the denominator, x cannot equal 8. And because of the numerator, x must be less than or equal to 2. Observe that x not equaling 8 is redundant given that x must be less than or equal to 2, so it was never going to be 8 anyway. So the domain of this function is entirely controlled by its numerator, and therefore the domain is x less than or equal to 2. Problem 5. A polynomial of degree 4 is graphed here. First, what's the equation of f of x? So we'll look at the roots and try to determine their multiplicities. x equals minus 2 is a root, and the graph crosses the axis here. 
So x plus 2 is a factor of this polynomial, and it must be of odd multiplicity because x equals minus 2 was a crossing root. Similarly, x equals 1 is a crossing root, so x minus 1 is a factor of odd multiplicity. And x equals 3 is a non-crossing root, so x minus 3 is a factor of even multiplicity. But the sum of all these multiplicities must be the degree of the polynomial, can't be larger than at least. So we have an odd number plus an odd number plus an even number, and it can't be bigger than four. That really narrows down the possibilities. We have x plus two to the first, x minus one to the first, and x minus three squared, but all of this is times an unknown leading coefficient, a. And here's where the point zero two comes into play. Since f of zero equals two, we can go ahead and plug in x equals zero and f of zero equals two to get two is equal to a times two times minus one times minus three squared. We simply let x equal zero and solve that f of zero must equal two. This gives us that a must be negative one ninth. Now that we have a value for a, we have f of x is negative one ninth times x plus two times x minus one times x minus three squared. Part B was compute the value of f of four, but since we found the formula for f of x in part A, all we have to do is plug in four for x, and we have negative one ninth times six times three times one squared, and this resolves down to negative two. Problem six. Find all x's which solve the inequality 2x cubed plus 14x squared plus 10x plus 1 must be less than or equal to 3x squared minus 2x plus 10. Now the first step in any of these polynomial or rational inequalities is move everything to one side. I'm going to subtract 3x squared from both sides, add 2x and subtract 10. This gives the inequality 2x cubed plus 11x squared plus 12x minus 9 is less than or equal to 0. The utility of getting this compared to zero is that finding roots of this polynomial, in other words, where it is equal to zero, is now relevant to solving the question of where it is less than or equal to zero. So we now have a polynomial less than or equal to zero, and all of its coefficients are integers, which means we can apply the rational roots theorem. Any rational root must be of the form plus or minus a factor of the constant term, which is nine, over a factor of the leading coefficient, which is two. This gives a pretty short, but not super short, list of possible rational roots, plus or minus 1 over 1, 3 over 1, 9 over 1, or 1 over 2, 3 over 2, 9 over 2. This gives us a lot of different numbers we can try, specifically 12, different numbers that might be rational roots of this polynomial. They can't all be, but some of them might be. So we have a lengthy-ish list of rational numbers that might be roots. Let's start by computing what the function evaluates to at the simplest things. So if you just plug in x equals one, you will very clearly not get zero. You'll end up with two plus 11 plus 12 minus nine, that's definitely positive. If x equals negative one, you get negative two and negative 12 plus 11 minus nine is definitely negative. So plus or minus one are not roots. Similarly, three, if you plug it in, observe, two times three cubed plus 11 times three squared plus 12 times three is going to be quite large. Minus nine is not gonna make it equal zero. But if you plug in x equals minus three, you'll end up with two times negative three cubed and 12 times negative three. Those negative numbers will actually be enough and overall, if you plug x equals negative three into this polynomial, you will get out a zero. Since x equals minus three is a root, x plus three must be a factor. So since x plus three is a factor of this polynomial that we're now comparing to zero, we're gonna do long division to see what remains if we divide it out. So here we have set up, we're going to divide x plus three into two x cubed plus 11 x squared plus 12 x minus nine. The first thing we need to do is cancel out the two x cubed using our x, so we have a two x squared. We then multiply across by our x plus three and subtract. This leaves behind 5x squared plus 12x minus 9. Now we need to cancel out the 5x squared using our x, so we do a plus 5x. Multiply and subtract. Now we have negative 3x minus 9. And to cancel out the negative 3x with our x, we do a minus 3. And this will exactly give us a remainder of 0, as it should have, because we knew we had a proper factor. So once we have factored out x plus 3 from this polynomial, what remains is 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. 
So by performing the polynomial long division, this polynomial that we're comparing to zero is now x plus three times two x squared plus five x minus three. And we're still in the problem of finding the roots, but what remains over there is just a quadratic. And it factors by sight or using the quadratic formula if necessary as x plus three times two x minus one. So now we've changed our original problem into x plus three times x plus three times two x minus one must be less than or equal to zero. So we have a non-crossing root at x equals minus three because it appears twice, it has even multiplicity. And we have a crossing root at x equals one half. So we can set up a number line. Here's our number line. Let's put down x equals minus three is a non-crossing root, but x equals one half is a crossing root. So we turned our original problem into the equivalent problem of where is this polynomial less than or equal to zero. We've determined we have a non-crossing root here and a crossing root there. Now this polynomial has leading coefficient positive two. If you were to expand it all back out, you'd reclaim that two x cubed. So since we have a polynomial with positive leading coefficient, as x goes to infinity, the polynomial goes to infinity and therefore must be positive. So we must be positive all in this region past this root here. And now we can complete our sign chart. The function is positive in this region and then changes sign so it becomes negative and then doesn't change sign so it remains negative over here. So now we can answer the question, where is this product of terms less than or equal to zero? It's less than zero, then we're at a root, so it's equal to zero, which is to be included. Then it's less than zero, then it's a root, which is included, then it's positive, which we are not including. So altogether, everywhere up to and including one half is going to be the region where this function is less than or equal to zero. Therefore, that's the solution to our original inequality. Problem seven, consider the rational function g of x equals 2x plus one times x plus one squared times x minus one over x squared times x plus one times x plus three. First, we're asked, does the graph have any holes? If so, where? If not, how do you know there are none? Now, the factor of x plus one down here in the denominator can be canceled out with the numerator. If I go ahead and cancel this factor down in the denominator, it just removes one such power from the numerator. That is to say, the reduced form of this rational function is 2x plus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 1 over x squared times x plus 3. So in the original form, x equals 0, negative 1, and negative 3 are removed from the domain. But in reduced form, only x equals 0 and x equals minus 3 are still roots of the denominator. Since x equals negative 1 is no longer a root of the denominator in reduced form, that tells us we have a whole when x is equal to minus one. But what's the corresponding y value? Now, as we said, as long as x isn't equal to minus one, this is really the simplified version of g of x that you can compute. To find the y value at a whole, we're simply going to take this x value of negative one and plug it into the reduced form and see what we get. It's not in the graph, but it does tell us the location of the whole. Plugging in x equals minus one will give us a negative one and a zero and a bunch of other stuff, who cares? We have a zero in the, in the numerator as a factor, so overall y is zero. That is to say, when x is equal to negative one, we have a whole at negative one comma zero. Does the graph have any vertical asymptotes? If so, where? If not, how do you know? Well, we found points to remove from the domain, zero, negative one, and negative three. X equals negative one gave us a whole, but X equals zero and X equals negative three are still roots of the denominator in reduced form. Therefore, those are your vertical asymptotes, X equals zero and X equals minus three. Does the graph have any horizontal asymptotes? If so, where? If not, why not? Now the numerator and denominator of g of x, either in its original form or in its reduced form, are of equal degree. In its reduced form, I have a degree three, I have a two x times x times x over x squared times x over degree three. So both numerator and denominator of degree three. In the original form, they would both be of degree four, I just canceled one power of x out of both. But either way, numerator and denominator have the same degree. Therefore, horizontal asymptote is found by taking y to be the ratio of leading coefficients. The numerator will have leading coefficient two if you expand everything out, and the denominator will have leading coefficient one. Therefore, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals two over one, or just y equals two. Problem eight, find all x which solve the given inequality. We have an inequality involving rational functions. The first step is to move everything to one side. I'm just gonna move everything to the left. So I have subtracted x minus three over x plus two from both sides. This allows me to compare something to zero, but I have a difference of two rational functions. 
So I'm going to give them a common denominator of x minus 2 times x plus 2. So the first term has been multiplied by x plus 2 over x plus 2, the second term by x minus 2 over x minus 2, but they do now have the same denominator. So since they have the same denominator, I can make this a single rational function compared to zero. But my numerator is now a difference of two terms, and I'm going to want to find where it's equal to zero. So I'm going to need to expand it all out, simplify it, and then factor it. So let's distribute everything out and simplify. That will turn the numerator into negative x squared plus 8x. There is a plus 6 and a minus 6 that cancel each other out up there. So we've changed our original problem into the following. Negative x squared plus 8x over x minus 2 times x plus 2 is bigger than or equal to 0. Now what we need to do is factor the numerator. And it factors as follows. If you factor out a negative x, what is left behind is going to be an x minus 8. If you factor a negative x out, what's left behind is an x minus 8. So in factored form, our rational function that we are now comparing to 0 is negative x times x minus 8 over x minus 2 times x plus 2. So now we can observe the following. This rational function has a crossing root at x equals 0 and a crossing root at x equals 8. Those are the roots of the numerator, and they are of odd multiplicity. We also have a vertical asymptote at x equals minus 2 and a vertical asymptote at x equals plus 2, and the sign will change on alternate sides because they also have odd multiplicity as roots of the denominator. So now we can test a single value. Let's just plug in x equals 10. If x equals 10, we can compute that overall you have negative 10 times 2 over 8 times 12. This is going to result in a negative number. So we have found all of our roots, vertical asymptotes, remarked whether the sign changes or doesn't on alternate sides, it will change everywhere, and we've computed one test value. So now we can make our sign chart. We know we have a sign changing vertical asymptote at x equals minus 2, a sign changing vertical asymptote at x equals plus 2, we have a crossing root at x equals 0, and we have a crossing root at x equals 8, and our single test value of x equals 10 is off to the right of all of these and gave us a negative value. And now we can fill in our entire sign chart. We were negative at x equals 10, but then we have a crossing root when x equals 8, which means we become positive. We have a sign changing vertical asymptote, which means we become negative. We have a crossing root, so the function will become positive. And then we have a sign changing vertical asymptote, so it will become negative. We've now completed our sign chart. So altogether, where is this thing greater than or equal to zero? Nope, it was negative here. We never include vertical asymptotes. The function isn't defined there. In this region, it is positive. Then I have a root, which I am including. Negative, not including that. Vertical asymptote, we never include. Positive, so the function this region does count a crossing root we are including roots and then negative so we're not going to include that altogether from negative two but not including it because that's a vertical asymptote to zero which we do include because we were including equal to zero in this problem and then again from two not including it because that's a vertical asymptote up to eight which we include because that's a root and the last problem consider the rational function f of x equals 3x minus 1 over 5 minus x What's the domain of this function? Now, this is a rational function, which means the only restriction is the denominator cannot be 0. The denominator is 5 minus x. In other words, x can't equal 5. Otherwise, you're fine. So the domain is all real numbers except 5. Next, what's the range of this function? We're going to find the range of the function by finding the domain of its inverse. So to find f inverse, we're going to write y equals 3x minus 1 over 5 minus x, switch all of your x's and y's, and then try to solve. So when you reverse all of your x's and y's, we now have x equals 3y minus 1 over 5 minus y. Multiply both sides by 5 minus y and distribute. Now we're going to collect all of our y's to one side. I'm going to put them on the right and everything else on the left. So adding 1 to both sides and adding xy to both sides gives us this. The point being that on the right, we can factor out a y and divide by 3 plus x. So here is our inverse function. f inverse is given by 5x plus 1 over 3 plus x. So what's the domain of this inverse function? Its denominator can't be zero. So the domain of f inverse is all x other than negative three. 
But remember, we wanted to find the range of f. So the range of f is all y's other than minus 3, because we started off by switching x's and y's. So instead of the response here being x can't equal negative 3, since we're talking about the range of f, it's all y's other than negative 3. And that's it. That was the entire exam.